Welcome to part two of my rewrite for Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. If you haven't seen part one yet, I highly recommend you go watch it. But if you're busy or you haven't seen it in a while, here's a quick recap. In my first video, I covered Act 1 and the first half of Act 2. And in this video, I'll be finishing up the last half of Act 2, along with the third and final act. So, in this version, Rey is renamed Kira, and she's a selfish scavenger on Endor instead of the planet Jakku. One day, she meets R2-D2, and in the wreckage of the second Death Star, they find one of Emperor Palpatine's star maps, and it details all of the secret Jedi temples in the galaxy. Kira and R2 are whisked away on a journey by a charismatic smuggler named Sam, who turns out to be Han Solo's youngest son. With the map to all of the secret temples, Kira, R2, Sam, Han, and Chewbacca go on a quest to find Luke Skywalker, who is still in exile at the first Jedi Temple. They go on several adventures and along the way, Kira realizes that she can use the Force, and that scares her. Sam hopes that once they find Luke, the old Jedi can teach Kira how to use her power for good. Kylo Ren and General Hux have a competition as to who can track down the map to Skywalker first. The winner earning Supreme Leader Snoke's good favor. The crew of the Millennium Falcon are on their way to their last lead to Skywalker, a pirate queen named Maz Kanata. Now, let's get started on the second half of Act 2, sometimes referred to as the bad guys close in. The Millennium Falcon lands on Tekudena, and this scene pretty much plays out the same way it does in the original film. Maz isn't too happy to see Han, but is still civil towards him. There's also a deleted scene from the original that I'd like to keep for this rewrite. While Han and Chewie are talking to Maz, the rest of the crew splits up to go entertain themselves. Sam and R2 go to the gaming table. While Kira wanders around the castle, Kira's arm is suddenly grabbed and she turns to see the blobfish, flanked by some of his goons. He's been tracking Kira ever since she crossed him on Endor, and now he wants to get even. Kira pulls out the pistol Han gave her and points it at her assailant, but Blobfish snags it out of her hands. Chewbacca suddenly steps in and takes the gun away from Blobfish, giving the junk boss a warning growl. The Blobfish foolishly picks a fight with Chewbacca, which results in the Wookiee ripping off one of the Blobfish's arms and flinging it across the castle and onto the gaming table. The rest of the goons scatter, leaving their master squirming and yelling on the floor. I wanted to keep this scene because it plays into Kira's arc. It shows that while Kira is still trying to figure out what it means to be part of a family, one of her teammates can step in to back her up and physically show her what that kind of support looks like. While this is going on, spies of both the First Order and the Resistance alert their respective organizations of the Millennium Falcon's presence. Maz becomes fascinated with Kira, looking her up and down and staring into her face the same way she does to Finn in the original. Like Lor Santeca, Maz can recognize that Kira is strong with the Force, but she can also sense Kira's fear and anxiety. Once Han explains the reason for their visit, Maz's interest is piqued. Maz admits that in her younger years, she spent centuries traveling across the galaxy, collecting relics and artifacts that called out to her through the Force. Even her castle and his abandoned Jedi Temple that she converted into her own personal base of operations. After the Empire was overthrown, Maz agreed to help Luke find talismans like ancient holocrons and sacred texts that would help him rebuild the Jedi Order. Kira finds Maz to be a wonderful mystery and asks her if she ever was a Jedi. Maz replies that during her travels she did meet a few Jedi and even learned a few tricks from them, but the boring temple life held no appeal to her. She loved her free-spirited lifestyle too much to give it up and all this time she's managed to keep her abilities a secret from those who serve the dark side. Maz shows Kira Luke's old lightsaber and when she touches it, she experiences the same vision from the original film. She's terrified by this vision and decides that she doesn't want to be a Jedi, or even a part of the Falcon's crew anymore. It's not because she dislikes any of her new friends, but Kira, who is so used to being alone for so long, is still uncomfortable with the idea of committing to other people and putting their needs above her own. Sam tries to convince Kira to stay, but he fails, and he's sad to see her leave to go join up with the Crimson Courser and his crew. Kira says goodbye to each of her crewmates and tries to return Han's pistol to him, but he tells her to keep it and to make sure that she stays out of trouble. Maz then takes the remaining heroes down to her basement to search through her collection in hopes of finding something that could lead them to the first Jedi Temple. But the castle is suddenly bombarded by the First Order. The Knights of Ren and Hux's battalion arrive at the same time to claim their prize, their competitiveness intensifying as they each come closer to their goal. Together, the pirates and the crew of the Millennium Falcon make a stand against the First Order. Captain Phasma approaches Sam and challenges him to a rematch. Similar to the stormtrooper who challenges Finn to a fight in episode 7. She claims that her honor still needs to be satisfied 
since he bailed on their last duel. Sam picks up Luke's lightsaber and smirks. With the weapon of a Jedi in his hand, this fight will be a piece of cake. But Captain Phasma drops her blaster, pulls out her baton, and activates it, creating an electric field around the baton that is strong enough to counter a lightsaber's blade. Kind of like those electro staffs that the Magna Guards used to use in the prequels. She twirls the baton in her hand with ease, confident in her skills. There is a moment of humor as Sam's eyes widen as he realizes that he is in over his head. Sam and Phasma fight it out, and the captain actually beats Sam pretty badly. Sam will have a Jack Sparrow moment where he realizes that he's sorely outmatched and decides to abandon the fight, dodging the battle around him as he tries to lose Phasma in the crowd of pirates and stormtroopers. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, and Captain Phasma catches up to him. She has him quartered and is about to kill him when she is suddenly knocked out by a blast from Chewbacca's bowcaster. The Knights of Ren are chopping through their enemies like their mincemeat. Nobody can seem to stop them except the heavy hitters like Chewbacca and Maz. The little that we've seen of the Knights of Ren so far in the Real World trilogy shows us that the Knights don't wield lightsabers like their leader. That leaves us to assume that as the Jedi Padawans, they were so early into their training that when they betrayed Luke, they didn't even assemble their own lightsabers yet. Ben was the most advanced out of the group, which is why he has one, but the others would wield axes, staves, and electro whips, and will use basic force moves like force push, pull, and force choke. I figured one or two of them could be killed in this battle, with one of the knights trying to use his amateurish force abilities on Maz, only for her to easily repel his attack and summon the roots from the ground to bury and suffocate him. Chewbacca would come up behind another knight, roaring as he lifts the knight up and breaks his back over his knee like Bane does to Batman. Kira is helping the Crimson Corsair and his crew load up their ship when the First Order attacks. Using her staff and pistol, Kira finds herself separated from her new crew during the battle as the Force guides her and influences her on her combat decisions, paving her the way to victory. But, despite their brave effort, the defenders are overwhelmed by the First Order through sheer numbers and the surviving pirates surrender. All of the prisoners are lined up in a row, and Kylo Ren walks down the line, inspecting each of the survivors. He finally stops at Sam, and he interrogates him on the location of the map to Skywalker. Sam refuses to give in, even when Kylo Ren puts his lightsaber inches away from Sam's face to intimidate him. Kylo Ren then decides to bring Sam to Supreme Leader Snoke, since nobody can resist his master's will. Kylo Ren knocks Sam unconscious with the Force, and uses said Force to make his body levitate and follow him to his ship. Han breaks away from the stormtroopers and pulls out a hidden blaster from his jacket, firing at Kylo Ren's back. Kylo turns around and freezes the blaster bolt in midair before walking up to Han to confront him. I also want to point out that at this time, the galaxy as a whole does not know that Ben Solo is Kylo Ren, and neither do Han or Sam. As far as everyone knows, Ben Solo disappeared after his fall to the dark side, bringing with him a group of fellow students that he managed to manipulate to his cause. But that was almost 10 years ago, and the First Order is still a relatively new organization, so none of the heroes or pirates will recognize Kylo and the Knights of Ren for who they truly are. You're not taking my son. He's not your son anymore. Han looks at him, angry and confused. You thought I died. Or at least, you hoped I did. You think I'm weak. You think my death would have washed away all of your shame. You're about to realize that you're wrong about everything, old man. Who the hell are you? Kylo then removes his helmet and shows his face to everyone present. Some are unimpressed. Some are curious. Chewie grunts in surprise and Maz gasps. If Han wasn't already frozen by the Force, he'd be paralyzed with shock. He looks directly at a ghost from his past. Ben, I said, not anymore! Kylo punches Han to the ground and kicks him several times before placing the helmet back onto his head. He turns and continues making his way to his ship with the unconscious Sam and the remaining Knights of Ren in tow. General Hux steps in front of Kylo Ren, blocking his path. A platoon of stormtroopers stand at attention nearby. Hux and Ren enter into a heated argument over who gets to deliver the prisoner to Supreme Leader Snoke. The tension rises between the two leaders' respective parties as well. It appears that the Knights of Ren also share a rivalry with the Stormtroopers. The troopers will begin taunting and insulting the Knights in an attempt to instigate a fight out of them. The argument builds up and intensifies as Hux starts to shout. Kylo Ren ignites his lightsaber and the Stormtroopers aim their blasters at the Knights, who also draw their weapons. Kylo and Hux stare each other down intensely until Hux finally gives in and orders his men to stand down. Just as the knights board their ship with Sam and take off into space, the resistance arrives. When the X-Wings come to the rescue, the heroes use the chaos to their advantage and rejoin the fight. Poe Dameron's squad in the sequel trilogy, known as Black Squadron, 
will wipe the floor with the first order, forcing General Hux and Captain Phasma to retreat from Tekodena. Once the dust settles, we will get the same reunion scene between Han and Leia that we see in the original film, along with a bonus reunion between R2 and C-3PO. Maz will pick up the lightsaber that Sam dropped during the battle and deliver it to Leia. It belongs with the Skywalkers. Leia will use the Force to summon the lightsaber into her hand. Maz raises an eyebrow at her. Between raising a family and being the Republic's chief of staff for over 10 years, I only had time to learn the basics. Maz will nod and smile before volunteering to help the Resistance strike back at the First Order. Maz has always liked to remain a neutral player in galactic conflicts, but now that the First Order has gone out of their way to destroy her home and base of operations, it's become personal, and she wants to get even with the First Order. Leia is glad to accept the Pirate Queen's help. Maz reveals that her flagship, the Marauder, is kept docked in a secret hangar underneath the river. What's left of Maz's crew joins their captain as they fly off with the Falcon back to the Resistance HQ on Dakar. And this is the close of Act 2. Act 3. In the original version of Episode 7, the First Order's HQ is on Starkiller Base. But for this rewrite, I want to put the First Order's headquarters on the forest planet of Dantooine. Some of you may remember as the planet that Leia mentions in her lie to Grand Moff Tarkin about the Rebels HQ back in Episode 4. In earlier drafts of Episode 7, the First Order was meant to occupy the abandoned Rebel base on Dantooine and convert it into their new headquarters. So, for this rewrite, we'll stick to that, just because I think the idea of a death planet is kind of ridiculous. Which brings me to my next edit, Starkiller Base. In the original drafts, the First Order's super weapon was a giant laser cannon built inside of an old volcano on Dantooine, and the weapon fueled itself by draining energy from nearby suns within the solar system. I like this design a lot better for Episode 7, since it is not a complete ripoff of the Death Star, and it also brings figurative and literal darkness to the galaxy by sucking the life out of stars. This weapon was called the Doom Star in earlier drafts of the script, but we can still call it the Star Killer, since the name does fit the weapon's design pretty well. So. Act 3 opens on Dantooine within the First Order's base. Sam is strapped to a table like Rey was in the original, and he's interrogated by his brother, Kylo Ren. Kylo removes his helmet and sits down, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with his estranged brother. This isn't the Kylo Ren that the First Order knows. This is Ben Solo, the vulnerable, firstborn of Princess Leia and Han Solo, who wanted nothing more than to please his family. This is the brother that Sam shared a childhood with, and this is the first time he's shown his old self around anyone since his turn to the dark side. Sam and Ben talk about their parents and their different opinions on their father. Sam understands Han isn't perfect, but that he did the best he could, while Ben sees him as nothing but a disappointment, an old and tired legend who has no place in the world anymore. Sam criticizes Ben for blaming his misdeeds on their dad, and that his decision to join the dark side broke their mother's heart. Ben shows some remorse at this revelation as he admits that Leia, even though she was very busy as a politician, always found time to give Ben and Sam her love and support. Sam had always favored their dad, while Ben had been a mama's boy. But Leia betrayed Ben. She betrayed both of her sons by keeping the truth of their identities from them. She never told her boys that they were the grandchildren of Darth Vader, one of the most notorious Sith Lords in history. Sam understands why Leia never told him, as she wanted to protect her innocent children from their family's dark past. But Ben sees it as a betrayal of trust and a monstrous lie from both Leia and their uncle Luke. Ben had to find out the truth about his grandfather from a hollow vid that went viral after one of Leia's political rivals had discovered the truth about her parentage and used the information to discredit her and ruin her career as a politician. Sam remarks that the whole family suffered from that secret, not just Ben. But Ben cannot see past his anger. He abruptly ends the conversation when an announcement is heard through the base's speakers, summoning all personnel to the hangar. Ben stands up and puts the helmet back on. Ben Solo was gone. Only Kylo Ren stands before Sam now. He informs Sam that Supreme Leader Snoke is on his way to Dance Ween, and that he will pry the map to Skywalker from Sam's mind before walking out of the room. Sam is left alone with his silence. Out on the hangar, the entirety of the First Order is assembled in front of General Hux, Kylo Ren, Captain Phasma, and the Knights of Ren. A giant hologram of Supreme Leader Snoke can be seen behind the First Order's lieutenants. Hux announces the completion of their new superweapon, the Star Killer, and that they will test it by targeting the Resistance fleet above Hosnian Prime. Hux delivers the same hateful speech regarding the downfall of the First Order's enemies that he does in the original film, and orders the weapon to fire. The Star Killer drains half of the suns within Dantooine's solar system, 
and launches a giant laser that pierces through space and completely obliterates a fleet of resistance ships. The First Order watches on, almost in fear, at the power they have just unleashed. We cut to the Resistance headquarters on Dakar, as the Resistance leaders scramble upon hearing the news of the Starkiller's successful test firing and the loss of one of their fleets. A war council is summoned, and Leia briefs her commanders on the tragic loss of their garrison at Hosnian Prime. Kira, Han, Chewbacca, and Maz join in on the meeting, and Han proposes that he leads a strike team to Dance Wing to disable the Star Killer's shields, allowing the Resistance a chance to destroy it. Leia agrees with the strategy, and the Resistance mobilizes. Kira awkwardly approaches the crew of the Falcon as they gear up for the mission. She apologizes to her teammates for abandoning them, and swears that she wants to make things right by helping them rescue Sam, since she also feels at fault for his capture. There's a brief moment of silence as the Falcon's crew just stares at her. Chewbacca suddenly rushes forward and happily wraps Kira up in a giant bear hug. Han smirks and welcomes Kira back. He holds nothing against her and understands why she is afraid. It's time for both of us to stop running. It's about time I had a talk with my boy. Leia walks into the armory to wish the Falcon's crew good luck. Han introduces her to Kira, and Leia recognizes the kyber crystal necklace Kira is wearing. Like Maz and Lor Santeca, Leia can sense that Kira is strong with the Force, and when she finds out that she is joining the rescue team, she gives Luke's lightsaber to Kira, telling her that it will be put to better use in rescuing her son than sitting in the command center with Leia as she directs the resistance attack. Kira promises to return the lightsaber along with Sam. Grateful for her help, Leia asks Kira, Chewie, and R2 if she can speak to Han in private. Han and Leia will have the same conversation regarding Ben's redemption that they do in the original, except at the end, Leia will say, bring our son home, both of them. Han will still pull the same risky light speed jump onto Dantooine's surface, and he'll barely avoid wrecking the Falcon as he lands in the forest. Using the lightsaber, Kira will cut open an entrance into the First Order base, and with the help of the Kyber Crystal Necklace, Kira will tune into the force and allow it to guide her and R2 to Sam. While they retrieve Sam, Han and Chewie will sneak towards the shield generator and realize that they can't get through the security without raising the alarm. They notice Captain Phasma marching by, and Chewie snags her and forces her to give them the access code to the shield generator. Because she has a gun pointed to her head, Captain Phasma complies, but she covertly alerts General Hux of the intruders by giving him a live feed through her helmet. Hux is about to raise the alarm when the Resistance fleet suddenly enters Dantooine's orbit. With Maz at the helm, the Resistance ships provide a distraction for Han's strike team by launching an attack on the First Order base. In a moment of humor, Han and Chewie can toss Phasma down the trash compactor after she gives them the access codes. While the battle rages outside, Kira will knock out the guards to Sam's cell with a force push before slicing through his bonds with the lightsaber. Astonished to see her, Sam is immensely grateful to Kira and gives her a warm embrace. You came back for me. Captain's orders. Sam smirks and picks up one of the stormtroopers' blasters as they race to the shield generator to rendezvous with Han and Chewbacca. As they run down the hall, Sam looks over at Kira and smiles. What? Nothing. Just glad to have you back. While Han and Chewie set the charges, Kylo Ren enters the generator room to investigate. The rest of this scene will play out the same way it does in the original with Han and Kylo's conversation ending with Han's death right as Kira, Sam, and R2 arrive to witness it. Except, right as Kylo impales his father with the lightsaber, we cut to a close-up of a pair of blue eyes suddenly snapping wide open. Without ever seeing his face, we see a cloaked and hooded Luke Skywalker stumble from his meditation and try to catch his breath as he recovers from feeling Han's death through the Force. Leia will feel the same sense of dread and loss as we cut back to the generator room. In the original film, we get a brief glimpse of Chewbacca's rage at his best friend's death, but I feel like it would be much more appropriate to show Chewbacca absolutely losing it. He needs to be kicking stormtroopers over the railing, slamming heads into the wall, ripping arms out of their sockets, and single-handedly routing all of the stormtroopers. The stormtroopers should run away in fear after Chewbacca grabs a dead stormtrooper and uses his body as the club to beat any stormtrooper he catches to a pulp, all the while roaring like a savage beast. Chewie will then finish off his kill streak by detonating the charges, deactivating the Star Killer's shields. Sam will try to join the Wookiee in avenging his father, but Kira will pull him away and insist that they need to get back to the ship. Kylo Ren, after being shot in the ribs by Chewie, goes after Sam and Kira. With the shields to the Star Killer down, the Resistance fighters bombard the super weapon. Kylo intercepts Kira and Sam in the Force before they can reach the Falcon. 
Traitor! Murderer! Sam grabs the lightsaber out of Kira's hand and charges his older brother. The two have the same short duel that Finn and Kylo Ren have, where Sam swings the lightsaber like it's a baseball bat because he's so unfamiliar with the weapon. After a few reckless strikes, Sam is easily bested by Kylo, with Sam suffering a stab to the shoulder and his back being sliced wide open. Thinking Sam is dead, Kira force pulls Luke's lightsaber to her hand, wrenching it away from Kylo Ren right as he's about to claim it. The duel between Kylo Ren and Kira will remain the same, except Kira will be much more in tune with the Force than Rey was in the original film. This is her moment of triumph. Her arc is complete. Kira has learned how to put the needs of others before hers, and now her reward is that she can connect with the Force wholly and without fear. She's calm and serene, and confidently deflects all of Kylo's attacks while he continues to summon up all of his anger and viciously swing at Kira. While Kylo Ren still utilizes some technique with the blade, Kira's fencing reaches a whole other level once she opens herself up to the Force. The lightsaber becomes a natural extension of her arm, and Kylo's anger starts to betray him as his rage begins to consume his battle senses and blind his instincts, allowing him to slip up and give Kira an opening. She immediately jumps at the vulnerability and starts gaining ground, forcing Kylo Ren to backpedal away from her as she switches from defense to offense. Kira catches another slip up in Kylo's defenses, and she quickly takes the opportunity to slash his leg, following up with a jab to the shoulder, and giving him that nice facial that he gets in the original film. Kira is in complete control of the environment, and she demonstrates it by disarming Kylo Ren of his lightsaber and lifting him up into the air with a force. Before Kira can do anything else, a damaged X-Wing fighter starts spiraling towards them, and Kira drops Kylo and runs to avoid the exploding X-Wing. The Knights of Ren, each piloting their own TIE fighter, begin to circle the battlefield where their master lies. They land their ties in a circle around Kira and Kylo, and one by one, they menacingly exit their ships and draw their weapons, slowly surrounding Kira. She twirls the lightsaber, ready for the next fight. But before anything else can happen, the Starkiller is destroyed by a barrage of missiles and bombs from the Resistance fleet, resulting in a volcanic eruption that consumes the First Order's base. General Hux informs Snoke of the base's demise, and Snoke contacts the Knights of Ren directly, ordering them to leave the fight and bring Kylo Ren back to him to complete his training. The Knights of Ren reluctantly obey, leaving Kira behind in the forest and dooming her to a fate of being burned alive by the waves of lava coming downhill towards her. As the Knights of Ren fly away with Kylo, Kira checks Sam's pulse and realizes that he is still breathing. She lifts the unconscious Sam over her shoulders and persistently begins jogging away from the river of lava. But the weight of Sam's unconscious body is slowing her down, and she'll never outrun the lava in time. In a few moments, she'll be overrun. Suddenly, the Falcon lands in front of Kira, being piloted by Chewbacca and R2. This wraps up the climax of the film, and we now transition into the resolution, the final piece of the third act. Victorious, the Resistance fleet returns to Dakar to celebrate their success, but Leia can't smile. As soon as the Falcon's hatch opens, Chewie solemnly walks out and embraces Leia tightly, groaning with sorrow. Maz and the other Resistance pilots surround General Leia with joy, but their smiles fade once they see how serious their leader is. What happened? Han didn't make it. The faces of every Resistance member falls at the hearing of Han Solo's passing. Kira emerges from the Falcon, carrying Sam on her shoulders, and Leia rushes towards him and stays by his side fighting back tears while medical droids load him up onto a gurney. While Sam sleeps in a coma-like state within a Bacta tank, the Resistance hosts a funeral service for Han. Kira, R2, Chewie, and C-3PO stand in the front row of the crowd as they assemble around a giant tree. Admiral Akbar, Nian Num, Maz, and even Lando Calrissian attend the service. General Leia Organa stands in front of the Resistance on a raised podium. Han fancied himself a scoundrel, but he wasn't. He loved freedom, for himself certainly, but for everyone else in the galaxy too. And time after time, he was willing to fight for that freedom. He didn't want to know the odds in that fight, because he had already made up his mind that he'd prevail. And time after time, somehow he did. Leia will take Han Solo's dice from her pocket and kiss it before wrapping it around one of the branches of the tree. She then takes the opportunity to read out the names of all the pilots who never made it back from Dantooine. While she does this, a cloaked and hooded figure can be seen, standing in the background, 
listening quietly to the service with their head lowered. Once the ceremony is ended, everyone goes their separate ways. Kira, Chewie, Lando, and Maz go for a drink, while Leia sits in her office alone. As she cries silently, the cloaked man enters the room and pulls back his hood, revealing himself to be Luke Skywalker. Luke takes his seat, and the brother and sister share the same reunion that they have in Episode 8. Leia quickly updates Luke on recent events and is able to convince him to rejoin the fight against the dark side. She tells Luke about Kira, and that she might be able to help the Resistance in ways only a Jedi can. Luke is reluctant to accept another student, but he gives in, and he agrees to meet with the young Force-sensitive girl. Luke approaches the group of heroes while they drink at the bar. Everyone is amazed to see the legendary Luke Skywalker in the flesh, and Lando has to call off all the Resistance members from huddling around the rebel hero, and he commands them to go back to their drinks. Lando and Luke will shake hands, R2 will beep and spin around his old master in circles, and Maz will order another drink for Luke. But Chewie isn't happy to see Luke. He roughly shoves the old Jedi to the floor, but Luke catches himself with the Force and softly Force pushes himself back onto his feet. Lando and Maz try to hold Chewie back, but he knocks them all off and aggressively gets in Luke's face, accusing him of being a faithless friend. He even goes as far as to blame Luke for Han's death, pointing out that if Luke hadn't gone into hiding, Han might still be alive. Luke, on the verge of tears, admits that everything Chewbacca has said is true. He apologizes for abandoning his family and friends, and announces that he is here to make amends. Chewbacca can't bring himself to stay mad at Luke after hearing his apology, and the two hug it out, with the upset Wookiee sniffling into Luke's hair. Kira is astonished to meet the legendary Luke Skywalker as he introduces himself to her, and he asks Kira if she'll have a seat with him. We'll then cut to Luke boarding the Millennium Falcon along with Chewbacca, R2, and Kira. The rest of their resistance will be present at the hangar with Leia to witness the mythical Luke Skywalker's departure. Kira and Leia will have some parting words, and she'll pull out Luke's lightsaber. I'm not sure who I'm supposed to give this to. You or... Kira looks over her shoulder to see Luke waving goodbye to the rest of the resistance. Leia will take Kira's fingers and close them around the lightsaber. That's something you're going to have to work out between you and your master. Leia winks mischievously at Kira and gives her a parting hug before Kira tucks the lightsaber into her backpack. The Falcon will then lightspeed to Octo and land on one of the islands. Luke will reminisce over sitting in the cockpit of the Falcon once more and Kira will stir him out of his nostalgia. Where are we? Welcome to the first temple of the Jedi Order. This is where I've been for the past 14 years and where you will begin your training. Are you ready to learn the ways of the Force, kid? Kira looks at Luke with anxious excitement, hesitant to cross into the unknown. Chewie puts a supportive hand on her shoulder and lightly grunts. Luke smiles at her, and Kira slowly smiles back. And that concludes my rewrite for Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. If you liked the video, please show your support by hitting that like button and sharing this video with the rest of your Star Wars friends. I know you guys have been asking for my rewrite in Transformers 2, and I promise that video will be the next one I upload. But in the meantime, let me know how you feel about this particular rewrite, and if you feel like I succeeded at creating a fresh new story by combining a healthy amount of nostalgia and original storytelling. Go ahead and share your thoughts down below, and may the force be with you.